Hi, I'm Dave Miller, Director of College Counseling at Stevenson School in Pebble Beach, California, and I'd like to welcome you to the fifth in our series this year of program we call College Prep for You. Uh, it's intended to inform parents and students in the Monterey County area, we've got about 25 schools or so, a little outreach program about the uh, in intricacies, some of the mysteries, uh, all the subtle things you need to know about this sometimes uh, disturbing process of applying to college and being accepted to college. We try to make it a little user friendly. Uh, in today's show, we're going to talk about two things that are a little less important, but nonetheless uh, can, can be key in your application. Uh, the interview and uh, getting good recommendations. And they're fairly poignant and, and pertinent right now because we're writing the interview season. And uh, the recommendations, we're a little bit behind in terms of recommendations. If you haven't been working on those, you're a little bit behind uh, the scene. But this will be good for the juniors to anticipate in the future. So we're going to talk about the interview and we're going to talk about uh, getting good recommendations. Uh, in the past, we've had a good, broad, general overview of the process. Uh, another show, we had a panel at Stevenson School in the chapel where we had students asking questions of um, college admissions officers from all over the country. Uh, we talked about the UC and the Cal State system, and then we talked uh, last time about financial aid, all those sorts of aspects. Uh, in future shows, we're going to cover other aspects of this program. Uh, in fact, next January, early in the month, January 6th, I'd like to uh, uh, invite you to join us for uh, a discussion of standardized testing, the thing we love to hate. Uh, before we get started, let's meet our guests. I'm lucky enough to have a parent and a student from Stevenson who are really going to be the experts on this. Uh, Rick Littlefield and his daughter, Cami. Let's start with Cami, uh, beauty before age, I guess. Uh, Cami, what can you tell us about yourself? Um, well, I'm currently a senior at Stevenson School, and um, I'm on the soccer team, and I'm also involved in Senior Forum. Okay, how about the application process? Where are you? Oh, okay. Well, I, um, I just applied early to Dartmouth, and I'm waiting to hear back. I'll hear back December 15th, and um, just about finished with my other applications. Yes. Yeah, um, uh, Cammy, like a lot of these kids that I, I have on this program, are probably a little, little humble, little self-effacing, and we probably won't uh, tell you the real story. She's one of our really strong students in applying to uh, uh, very selective schools. She's also an outstanding soccer player. She's got a resume that's a mile long, and we feel pretty confident about her, and, and I'm sure her dad's pretty proud of her. Uh, we're going to talk with uh, Cami about, about the interview she had at Dartmouth and uh, about getting the good recommendations. So you'll hear some theory and then you'll have some application as well. Rick, how about you? Uh, tell us a bit about yourself as a parent and then your real job. Sure. I'm Rick Littlefield. I'm a father of four, I'm a 25 year old, 23, Cami, and a 12 year old. And I'm a director of a children's summer camp on the East Coast called Robin Hood Camp. It's an international children's summer camp and my job is to run around the world interviewing children and families for a living. So you're the real pro then, so I, I didn't, didn't make a mistake getting you on this show. <laughs> and then you can also comment on uh, what you've seen in the process in terms of uh, Cammie's interview and also the recommendations that uh, mm -hmm. she's chosen to do. And you took care of that a while ago, right, your recommendations? Um, I did, probably yeah. about two months ago. Yeah, so you're all set. Okay, well let's get started with this uh, PowerPoint. We're going to start with the interview and uh, just generally the, the role of the interview. Uh, basically, I've divided into, into uh, two types of interviews. So there's an inter information interview and an evaluation interview. Uh, the former is a little less important. Uh, the second one, the evaluation interview, is the key thing. So pay attention to these. Now, why do we have interviews? Uh, you don't have them for most schools. A very uh, select group, a small group, um, do have them. And they don't necessarily get you in, and they don't keep you out. Uh, so they're probably innocuous. The, they don't have a great bearing. But in a minor case, it can be the, the, the thing that tips the scale. And I'm going to give you a little example of that. Um, so when in doubt, in fact, I tell our students that they never have any options. If, if it's available, you've got to do it. Uh, and the example that I've given through the years is a young lady uh, in Marina that I had in my English class years ago who applied uh, to, to Hopkins. And I thought, frankly, it was a little stretch. And I hope her parents aren't listening to me. Uh, because she's very quiet, very, very unassuming, and you just wouldn't match her with such a high-powered school. But she had this interview on campus, which is pretty rare. And um, lo and behold, well, she got in. And she, in fact, she graduated in there, did a great job. I used to see her at the airport all the time. And I talked to the lady who interviewed her, uh, the, the, the local rep from, or actually the regional rep from uh, Hopkins, and she was just thrilled with this interview. It, it, it substantiated all the things we talked about and put in our letters. And she said the girl just did a knockout job. It's the first time I realized that the interview can really, really matter. And it was with this glaring example of a student that I thought would not interview well and, and 
you know, frankly, maybe didn't have a chance at Hopkins. So uh, that convinced me that the interview is an important thing. Now, there are a number of schools that do interviews just as a matter of course. In fact, there used to be one that you couldn't get into the school without it. Obviously, the Ivies, you know, the Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Dartmouth, uh, Penn, Cornell, Columbia, Brown, those schools, um, because they want more information and they've got this high-powered group of alumni that can spend this sort of time, they've got the wherewithal to do that. And they also want more information uh, to comb out and sift out uh, those students that, that uh, maybe they don't want to include. So it's sort of a negative process. Uh, Duke, we have a local alum who's one of our parents who does Duke interviews. Georgetown always comes to our campus. USC used to do more. They're cutting back on that a little bit less, but uh, they'd come and do our borders. And I found out today in the paper, if you look in the Herald, Wake Forest, uh, they got away from standardized tests and they've included uh, interviews. So that's a big thing with Wake Forest now. And the good news with Wake Forest is they're doing it over the uh, webcam and I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, Lewis and Clark uh, usually has that for our students. That's a big part for them. And then Denver, University of Denver, used to be mandatory. It's, it's still pretty in that 90-95% range, although they, they will accept some students who can't do the interview, but they think it's so important that they want to talk to every one of their students. So as you can see, it's, it's basically the upper end of the food chain. They're very selective schools. It's a hoop you have to jump through. And it can be the thing that uh, if you, if everything is, everything is all equal and you've got a great interview and you do not, I've got to go with the great interview. Uh, and, and that sounds harsh, but sometimes that can be it. Um, okay, who does these things? Uh, what's the interview hierarchy? Uh, well, the most important is the dean of admissions. If you're lucky enough to uh, see him on campus or if he comes to uh, your campus, he's the guy that makes the decision. He's got to sign off on uh, all of these people. Uh, next in line is the rep in, uh, that's assigned to your school in your region. And they always come and, and talk to us, and I always tell our students, you've got to make a, a really good impression with that person because they're going to be reading your file. And if you can get that uh, interview on campus, it's wonderful. And if you have to do it later, but, but take advantage and, and build up that uh, sort of reservoir of, of, an, of an impression. Uh, next is an any admissions officer, and that could be hit and miss, and that won't be quite as effective. And then. Uh, way less effective is, is an alum, and I can say this with some authority because I've interviewed uh, with my, my uh, schools, in fact I ran my school's alumni schools interviewing committee for years and uh, it seemed to me that they paid no attention to me. In fact, uh, anybody that I liked and I wrote a wonderful uh, resume and summary of, they never got in and the people I didn't like seemed to get in, so I'm not sure that the alumnus thing uh, works too well. And then probably the one that really doesn't matter at all is the undergraduate uh, student. Uh, my daughter went to, uh, interviewed at, at Middlebury in the summertime and this Maybe a junior sophomore girl talked to her and it basically had no impact. It was ma mainly a conversational thing and helping out the university. Um, so the order of importance is um, you know, pretty clear. Now, where does, where does the interview stand in terms of getting in? Uh, first and foremost, it's always going to be the same thing, grades and honors and AP classes. And uh, cami has got that covered pretty well. Uh, next is standardized tests, especially for these difficult schools who require uh, an interview. Um, then after that, it can go in any order, class rank, although many schools don't use class rank. Um, activities, leadership, sports, drama, all those sorts of things. Next is the counselor recommendation. I would like to feel that's a little bit more important since that's what I do with my job all the time, but uh, I'm down the line here. And then even below that is the teacher recommendation. And then way below that is the interview. But the interview is still a piece of the puzzle. Uh, so you need to take it seriously. Okay, the inter information interview that I talked about um, was um, <clears throat> basically about college. You know, they want to fill in the blanks and tell you about their school. Uh, the person doing the interviewing will maybe intrude too much in the, in the, in the uh, conversation and tell you a little bit too much about him or her. Uh, sometimes it can be good because uh, you can get some issues clarified. You can ask questions. They can answer questions. It's, it's basically an exchange of, of facts and information. It gives the alumni something to do. It makes the old guys feel good and maybe shakes their wallet a little bit. They'll give a little bit more money to the school uh, if they've got a purpose. Now, have you had one of those? Have you had a, a, have. just an information interview? Mm -hmm. With whom? Um, it was with an alumni. Uh -huh. um, she lives up in the Bay Area. She but, but, but I'm not talking about the one for, for Dartmouth. I'm talking no. about just another one that was sort of inconsequential because your Dartmouth interview was important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Did you have one of these non-important interviews? Um, I guess not. Yeah. Now, all of yours, I presume, are important because that's how you Absolutely. make a decision. Yeah, they're, they're integral to uh, what you do. Now, what you had was the, the evaluation interview mm -hmm. where we're going to say, is Cami who we want? We've got to find that on a paper in the application and, and what the teachers say, but also here's your chance to show your strengths and, and your weaknesses. Uh, they also try to ferret out your academic ability. 
not based on paper, but based on what you know, how you comport yourself. Um, your potential to contribute to the school, they really want to find out you know, what you really know about horses. I can see what it is on paper, but I want to see what you can do and what role you really had in, in refurbishing that compound that you spent all your time doing and how much of a leader you're going to be. I, I need to find that out. I get, need to get a visceral feel for it, and that's what the uh, interviewer tries to do. Uh, they try to find your interest in life, um, your interest in their school and in school in general, you know, how, you know, how much do you really care about academics, and is this school a good match for you? you know, are we, are we you know, wasting our time or are we going in a good direction here? Uh, the things they want to see, what they, they, they like to see out of you, and this is hard for you to judge, but I'm going to put you on the spot here in a second, okay. is you know, personal appearance, you know, how you dress, what you look like, um, you know, that projection that you have. Could be from how you arrange yourself, the clothes you wear, uh, just this total impact uh, in your personal appearance. Uh, and the thing that's a little bit more difficult is the integrity. You know, the thing that we all love to see and it's hard to, hard to measure, but through this give and take, this conversation, these, these questions, they're going to find out what, what you have at the base and the core here. Uh, easy things like you're interested in the university and they have to sort of ferret out the genuine nature of that. Um, and then, you know, they try to get substance. They try to get rid of some of the superficial things that sort of look glossy on the paper, uh, but they really want to find out the meat and potatoes of, of, uh, of what you've got going on here. Uh, again, uh, you probably have a little advantage being a young, young lady, but they want to see the uh, maturity quotient. And uh, guys seem to fall a bit short here, and the girls have a little bit of an advantage. Uh, how are you going to blend in uh, as, a, as an adult? And then you want to see this pizzazz, this energy. And if you're sort of naturally um, an introvert, you might be at a disadvantage. But if you're a go-getter, a leader, an athlete, a sports person, you know, that's going to shine through. And everybody likes to see those sorts of people. And then they want to see commitment, whether it's to your job or your family you know, your horses, your team, whatever. They want to try to see that and measure that. And then all of that uh, sort of results in this sort of aura that you have, this confidence uh, that you project. And if, you, if you're short in any of these things, I'm not sure if you can get them in, you know, in, a, in a hurry for, for an interview, but it's more of a revealing. Now, that's a big, heavy load here. Mm -hmm. When you did your interview, where do you think you shined? What, what are those characteristics do you think you, you, you gave out? Um, well, I definitely, I definitely prepped myself um, in what ri reminded myself why I really wanted to go to the school mm -hmm. and um, made sure I was confident. And, and you were doing an early application. You decided right. Dartmouth was your place. Mm -hmm. You live and you die there. You visited it. I mean, it's the be all and the end all. And so you're putting your eggs in that basket. So this is really important for you. And Dartmouth's mm -hmm. one of those schools that uses that as a measurement. So the, sort of the heat was on you for that. Right, yeah, um, it was. But you did pretty well? I think so, I think so. Okay, well we'll come back to some questions in a second. Okay. Um, what I've said, Rick, how does that resonate with, with, um, with what you do? No, I think what I look for constantly is uh, element of enthusiasm mm -hmm. and character, uh, citizenship, uh, and really how's this person gonna play in, in my community? Mm -hmm. Are they gonna get along well and easily with others? Are their interpersonal skills strong? Will they have something to give? Mm -hmm. Or are they not quite connected to what I'd like to see? And it's something you sort of just know and recognize. I've been doing it for 25 years. Yeah. I better get a new profession. That's exactly. Like, yeah, you, you, you know it when you see it. OK, so if I'm going to do this for the first time, or if you're going to give some advice, how can somebody prepare for this? Um, well, first of all, I think students need to clarify the purpose of the interview. Is it that information, or is it the evaluation? How important is it? Um, confirm the details, where, where do I go, when is it, who's the person, you know, get all those who, what, why, when, and uh, those sorts of questions. Um, it's good to bone up on your information about the school, and one of my favorite stories is one of my students who uh, claimed on TV that he was going to go to Stanford and he was going to major in, I uh, was a football player of mine, he was going to major in architecture, and then of course, you know, you know after the, I got all the red off my face, um, you know, I, I mentioned to him that Stanford doesn't have architecture. So it's probably a good idea to know about the school a little bit, uh, because you might get one of those questions. And then also review some of your own personal information. You know yourself, uh, but it's a good idea to, to, to zoom in on those ideas where you really want to emphasize uh, your strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I think it's a good idea to look at our handbook, look at a bunch of different sources, talk to people who do it, you know, talk to your dad, people like your dad, and get a list of questions that they're going to ask you and a list, list of questions you might want to uh, ask them. 
and practice those beforehand. So that, that works both ways. I remember when I was uh, in high school going through all this, my mom, who was a nurse and hadn't gone to college, and, but I made her sit down on the couch and we played all these games and she was, she was the straight person and, and uh, you know, I think it helps. If nothing, it gives you the confidence uh, that you need to do it again. Uh, overall, I think you need to structure your game plan, not just go into it flying by the seat of your pants, but uh, you know, be organized and structured. Uh, what's your response to that? Did you do any preparation? Well, I did. I did. Um, I knew they were going to ask the why Dartmouth question, so I definitely prepared for that one. And so, what'd you say? Why Dartmouth? Um, well, I'm really interested in engineering, yeah. so I, I stress that. Yeah, and you're a jock. You know, that's a pretty jocky place. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, and it's sort of your neck of the woods. A lot of family history back mm -hmm. there. Yeah, yeah. love the East. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Rick, what are your thoughts on that preparation? What can you do? Oh, I do. I think you want to come armed, know as much about the school as you possibly can and, and how you feel you fit in that context. I know she was very keen as an engineering student and it's one of the school, few schools that has, an, has a graduate program where you can, as an undergraduate, take graduate style mm -hmm. classes and she knew that. And yeah. Was very well prepared and armed to answer the questions. Mm -hmm. In fact, we had a 3-2 student, one of the only 3-2 students I remember. He started, did two years at Lawrence and did his three years of engineering at Dartmouth, mm -hmm. graduated from Dartmouth. Had a great experience there. Okay, what do you bring to? Like I did this for years for my school and I would always be curious and I tell kids what to bring. Sometimes they bring some odd and funny things, but uh, it's a good idea to bring a resume to share it uh, if the person doesn't know much about you. Uh, I always, like, as an English teacher, I always like to see examples of the writing, especially a corrected uh, piece. Um, other things, if you're an artist or musician or you know, an athlete, whatever it is, you bring your thing. And I would even call something a wild card, you know, that surprise hidden thing that nobody would know about you that really represents who you are. Uh, that would be a big surprise. Remember the idea we're trying to separate you from other people uh, so that that interviewer, the people who are going to write for you, the people who are going to decide about you uh, are going to say, oh yeah, I remember that, that uh, tall engineer, soccer player. Yeah, she sticks out in my mind as opposed to these other kids that sort of all blend together. And that's, mm -hmm. that's one of the goals of this whole application process. So uh, where does this happen? Uh, a variety of different places. Um, the most important place and the lucky place if you do it is if you do it in the college itself where the people are on their turf because they're comfortable, you can see things. It's just ideal to do it there. They know that you've come a long way and it means business. Uh, most often they do it uh, in your neighborhood, your school. We do it in our, uh, at Keck and in the College Center in different places. And so that's comfortable for you and can give you a good sense of, uh, of temperance and balance. Um, my experience always was I made the kids come to, you know, Muhammad would come to the mountain and, and I would do it at my home because I could do several in a row and uh, sort of control things. Um, and so you might have to go to an alumnus uh, to do it. And you did yours where? This lady came from? Uh, um, they came from the Bay, or she came from the Bay Area, and we just met at a Starbucks. Okay, and that's, boy, you just stole my next thunder here. Yeah, um, at a neutral location. And I've done that in town, especially when I'm not sure I want to get stuck and I need to get a fast getaway or whatever. It, you know, it just, you're in, a, you're in a bad situation. You know, you can't leave your home if you're doing it at home. So uh, you can control some things that way. And now I just found out today that uh, Wake Forest and other, other schools soon will be doing it. They'll do it by webcam. You know, I've got a little camera right here on my, my uh, Mac here, my, my uh, laptop, and I talk to my kids at night, you know, in Boise and, and Palo Alto, and I've been doing this for years back in Boston, and I'm, th I'm thinking, why don't schools do that? And you cut out all the middlemen, and you could do it right there. You don't have to travel, and you're just using people's time efficiently. Well, Wake Forest, they just had an article in the Herald today. They're doing long-distance interviews with a webcam, and I think that's, that's, that's wonderful. And the bad thing is more people are going to want to do it now, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, would that matter to you, doing it to a camera? Um, I might be a little bit more nervous. Really? Yeah. yeah. I would think it would maybe be a little, a little more comforting. You know, yeah. This guy was talking about how he just came out of his room and is sort of casual and talked into the camera. Mm -hmm. And you guys are the, the laptop generation as well. Is your business going that way, Rick? Do you think you'll do that, or nothing takes the place of uh, the No, place? I'm old fashioned. Yeah, old school. I actually like to go directly into their home, yeah. sit on their couch where yeah. they're comfortable, yeah. in fact, as opposed to where I'm maybe not. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of old school and old fashioned, uh, I am that way too. And I like to see the kids dress up just a little bit, just a little click better than maybe they would at school. Casual, you know, not phony. Uh, natural, you, need, you have to be who you are, you don't want to come in a three-piece uh, uniform, uh, but clean, pressed, uh, impress someone that it matters to you. Again, just a click up from the normal, you know, no, no saggy jeans and you know, all of that stuff, holes in the pants. Uh, and then, you know, I, I think of the, I don't know if it was uh, Mark Twain or whoever said it, but clothes makes the man, and there's, or the women, and that's, you know, partially true, but, you know, it certainly can't hurt you. 
Um, does that matter when you're doing it with your kids? Oh, how somebody presents themselves yeah. if they're sloppy. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a factor. Mm -hmm. It means they don't care so much, I know. With how much did you dress up for Dartmouth? <laughs> well, um, probably wore something green, I bet. I did, actually. Yeah. Um, I came from soccer practice, yeah. and um, she told me it's fine if yeah. I didn't change, so I was just in my uniform. Good, so she saw the real you then. Yeah. Good. Um, well, attitude, you know, you can, you can wear uh, clothing, but you can also wear an attitude. And um, I think it's, you're never wrong if you're honest and natural in projecting who you are. You know, not too phony, not too excessive one way or the other, but clearly positive and upbeat. I don't think people like to sit around with a negative person. You know, woe is me, this is bad. So you never badmouth anything, you're never negative about things, especially the other school, and certainly not about the school you're you know, applying to. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to be pushy or too shovey, you want to be assertive, confident, uh, and that should come from who you really are. Uh, and also you don't want to go the other direction and be so overly self-effacing or humble or this false humility that the person can see right through you. And I can't imagine that you would, you would be that way. Um, and again, another, another uh, little trite saying here, but I think it's true. You only have one chance to make the first impression. You'll probably never see that person again and they won't see you again. So, you know, why not make it, you know, a good thing. Uh, in the 70s, people uh, were, were keen on body language. There was a real uh, number one best-selling book called Body Language, and I had my students read it, we talked about it, and I think there's still some good lessons about body language, and I'm sure you've, you could write a book on this yourself. Uh, and it's our culture, you know, probably the white male dominating culture where, you know, we look people right in the eye. And I think that's, that still serves. I think that's a pretty decent thing. Um, slouching, you know, sitting up, you know, you want to give, you know, the right message, not the wrong message. Um, <clears throat> I think this firm handshake and, you know, if we can get the camera back on us, you know, we can demonstrate what we're talking about. You know, I'm looking right at you, and it's not an assault, and it's not aggressive, but it means I'm here and I mean business. And when I, when I greet you, I'm looking right at you, and I'm giving you a good firm handshake. And I like the fact you gave me a, a good firm one back. Uh, and you do that at the beginning, you do it at the end, and you know, it just says some things about, about who you are. Um, the guys, again, have some trouble with this fidgeting. The girls, I don't think, do have many problems, but you know, and, I'm, and the younger kids you work with, I'm mm -hmm. sure you see that button going all the time. And you know, so that's something that, that, that sends a message. Uh, so the body language is a big thing. Uh, how we listen is also another important thing. Uh, and before we poison the well, just straight up, what advice would you give as a person your age who's gonna go through this process? What advice would you give about listening? About listening? Yeah. Um, to do it, to listen. <laughs> Um, but to, uh, yeah, no, be, take an interest in what the other person has to yeah, say. Exactly, that's being an active yeah. listener, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I presume you probably do more of the talking uh, in your job than these kids especially, but what advantage do you get when you listen to them? Well, actually, it's, it's a major defining difference between a lot of the people I interview. Some of the children are, have a lot of questions. I love it when you have a child who's asking questions. You know, they're not only engaged, they're probably bright. Yeah have something to give or are curious type are going to add to your community. Mm -hmm. So I love it when they ask questions. Yeah. Plus you get off the hot seat and, seat and let them uh, do yeah. some, of the, some of the work, carry the mm -hmm. load. Uh, so what we're talking about is active listening and, and we're all, you know, the people in our profession, you know, we're communicators, we're teachers, you know, we're sort of controllers and, you know, we love the sound of our own voice, but you have to sort of get back away from that and let the person, the other person be on stage, let them know that, hey, they're the important person and that's, that's why we're here, because of you. Um, I think. Uh, as both sides of the, of the conversation, uh, if you're an active listener, you're clarifying both questions and clarifying uh, answers. Uh, make sure that you address the question, like if the guy asks you what are you most what's proud of, then you veer off in another direction because you're not sure what you're most proud of. Uh, that can send out a signal. And, and, and just parenthetically, if you don't have an answer for something, it's okay to just have this pregnant pause and say, well, let me think about that. Or if you, if you really can't come up with it, let me, let me think about this for a day or so and I'll get back to you. You know, that's okay. Uh, I remember doing some of those things uh, as an interviewer. Um, so, uh, getting back to active listening, being involved, you need to focus on the question and not necessarily on what am I going to do for the answer. I mean, it's a hard thing to juggle, but you listen to the question, you prepare it, but you don't get lost in space uh, formulating uh, your answer and not listening to the person. Uh, and then also, a person might ask you something and you're too literal about it when he really has a question that wants you to read between the lines, you know, and, and he's, he's wanting to see if you'll pick up on that 
and run with the ball. And you know, as a literalist, sometimes you might miss the uh, the subtlety there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, some questions that that you might ask in this process: um, ones that aren't obvious, the ones that are not found in the brochure. Everybody's supposed to know those things. You know, ones that show that you you have a sense of sophistication and and you can delve into some subtle things. Like anything subtle about. Dartmouth that came up in your interview that you knew and she was surprised about? Um, well, I'm, I'm a horseback rider and I knew about their polo lacrosse team, yeah. um, which isn't, not many people know about Polo it. lacrosse? Polo lacrosse. Well, I knew about their polo team and their lacrosse team, but I didn't know about a polo. Oh, no. Team. So no, tell polo me. Polo lacrosse. Um, it's, uh, there's, I think there's three horses per team and um, it's basically lacrosse on horseback. And they're, they've got a, a, yeah, a, a, a unbelievable, scooper. I learned something today, that's why I do these things. <laughs> So are you going to do that? If I, if I get into Dartmouth, yes. Yeah, wonderful. Interesting. So those are a precise example of what I'm talking about here. Um, also, there's some probing, difficult questions um, that have to do with academics or the life there. Like, like I, would, I would want to ask, you know, Dartmouth's got this reputation of being very conservative, a lot of drinkers, a lot of right-wingers. How am I going to feel as a liberal young lady there? Mm -hmm. That's a pretty tough question, you know, that puts that... that um, you know, interview on, on, on the seat. So you might take a probe with that and, uh, you know, see how that goes. So things that are discerning, things that are subtle, uh, things that where you have an authentic give and take, uh, where it really matters to both of you. Uh, so you might want to give a thought to some personal questions, you know, what you want, how much you want to reveal about yourself or how much you elicit from the other person. You know, that's a little risky. Some things you might want to think about beforehand. Uh, a good example that, that um, I think is worthy is, uh, you know, what are my chances for grad school? Or, or what's the, the track record for Dartmouth getting into med school? Am I going to be able to do research, things like that? Um, and, you know, that's going to really show that you're an authentic learner here. Okay, what would be a question you would avoid? A question I would avoid? Yeah, a throwaway question, something that's going to hurt you. Uh, let's see. Um, I could talk about, well, I guess the food is a legitimate question. <laughs> Can be, can be. Can be. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Any hot guys? Here? Yeah, I was going to say that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's some things you definitely want to stay away from. Um, first of all, anything that's easily found in a book, you know, an easy answer, you know, don't waste everybody's time with that. Uh, things that are shallow, superficial, you know, what's the food like? You know, uh, what do people do to go get high? Obviously, you don't want to be doing things like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, are there hot guys, are there hot girls? I mean, things that, you know, are really going to work against you. Also, some Philistine materialistic questions, like understand you make boatloads of money when you leave here. I mean, that's not the purpose of Dartmouth education. Yeah. You know, what's the quickest trip to, the, to Wall Street? You know, that's probably not going to ingratiate yourself with this 28-year-old person who is dedicated to college, and they could be making money on Wall Street and you're sort of feeding into the opposite of what uh, this disposition is. So be wary of that. Uh, also ones that are, that are sort of indicate that you're shallow, mature, self-centered, a princess, you know, those things can, can work against you. Um, how hard is it to transfer? I don't think you want to start off the bat you know, <laughs> thinking about transferring from the school. So uh, use some common sense. Uh, generally, try to portray yourself as an adult. Uh, and if you're, if you're Rick, if you're talking to a young, you know, young kid, a teenager, um, Cammie's friends, how do you measure them as adults? What are the ingredients? What are you looking for? Oh, there are actually some trick questions which go, a good interviewer, I think, can elicit character issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm constantly looking, if I, I interview a lot of 16-year-olds, 15, 16-year-olds, yeah. I'm very probing uh, in as innocuous a way as possible mm -hmm. in anything that elicits the possibility that they're their habits are not good, they aren't positive, that there are any issues of even a trace of antisocial behavior I'm yep. looking for. And there, yep. there are ways to, a good interview knows how to get at that a bit. Yeah. Well, I think some, you know, some obvious ones, you have to know what's going on in the world, you know, politics and you know, ethical questions, things like that. Uh, and if you're sitting around the uh, dinner table at night with interesting parents, you may think that, that stuff's going to happen. Uh, obviously, it's ex an expectation when I do this, uh, I'd ask questions from the newspaper. I expect kids to be reading some papers and you know, getting some information other than on YouTube. Uh, so being conversant about politics and knowing about the world a little bit. And it's okay, I think, to take a stand on some issues. You, know, you have to be very careful about you know, some hot button issues, you know, some political things and you know, you know, life issues, right to life, those sorts of things. But you know, I, some interviews are, are going to want to have uh, to touch those things and whether which side of the issue doesn't matter as long as you've got some facts and some evidence and you've done some thinking about it uh, I think it's it's gonna be a worthwhile thing did you come across that in your interview um, with uh, Dartmouth I don't think she asked any tough questions like that she mm -hmm. just more she asked about me and why Dartmouth would so be it was basically fit. on you yeah, yeah. 
Okay, good. Uh, that's, in fact, that brings us to another good point here. A good way to get some mileage out of the interview is focus on the interviewer herself. Did you do that? Ask anything about I her? I did. I did. What did you ask her? Um, I asked her, I think, kind of a broad question, but what her favorite part about Dartmouth was. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. She said the people. And, and did you ask her the other one? what she didn't like about Dartmouth? No, I didn't ask yeah, that one. That could be a little dicey, but I think yeah. it's a, a decent thing to do. So show some interest in, uh, in your interviewer. Uh, what is your experience about old you? Uh, was it good? Was it bad? Uh, what did you like most about it? Uh, if you could change some things about it. Uh, how has it changed maybe since you graduated? Uh, like my school certainly changed a great deal since the dark ages when I was there. Um, so I think it's good to have that conversation. And, and if the person is, is realistic and has a good sense and good perspective, like through my years I would always have kids in, interviewing for my school, but they would always be crossing at like Santa Clara or Stanford, you know, a West Coast thing, and my school was East Coast. And I'd, I'd say, well, this is the strength of both of them because I would have a feel for it. And, you know, maybe try the East Coast, come back out here in the left, in the West Coast or the left coast, uh, and and uh, give that sort of sort of objective guidance. And I think the real good interviewers, you know, will see, you know, that they want to be, want you to be successful and have your best uh, interests at heart. So uh, a nice conversation. Um, ask some of these some of these good questions, some of these tough questions. Um, what what about college has helped you most in your life? In fact, that's a good question for you. What what did you do? And you went back east in New York somewhere. Mm -hmm. What did that education have to do with what you do right now? What's the single best thing you got out of it? Boy, out of you're asking the wrong person <laughs> to get as much out of my college education yeah. as I should. I will okay. confess. Well, that, that might even be a good lesson for somebody going into college right now. Mm -hmm. uh, most people, when I ask that question, there's very little relationship between what they do and what they yeah, prepare to do, um, which is sort of an interesting phenomenon. Okay, so we're going to focus on the interviewer. It basically, this whole application process is you telling your story. Like, I told Cammie's story in my supporting letter. Uh, as a parent, Rick helps me to tell that story, and Cammie does it in her essays and in the application itself. But this interview is the chance to really put a face uh, on all those papers. So I would suggest you prepare a little anecdote, you know, something that really tells something about you. And I'll tell you the one I told about you, but what would you, what would you say would be an anecdote that reveals Cammie? Hmm, an anecdote. Well, I talked about my accomplishment. It's not really an anecdote, but I built, um, I built horse stables back mm -hmm. east, which I thought was impressive. So. Yeah, and you, you put aside something that's a little more gram glamorous, a little more mm -hmm. glitzy, that would, you, most people would have more fun and, geez, this is a bigger deal, but you chose to do something that was, at your inner core, more important to you. Mm -hmm. I also told a story about you with how you were with your sister, oh, you know, a little okay. family thing, and, you know, then they know who you are. Mm -hmm. And this is the real McCoy. We're getting numbers, we're getting data, we're getting honors classes, we're getting standardized test scores, but we're really getting a good person here. And that's, that's what you've got to do with this uh, interview. So prepare an anecdote, tell a story, uh, and hopefully it'll illustrate a character trait. Um, and I don't think it's too bad to maybe tell a story on yourself that shows a little foible, a little shortcoming, uh, and it makes you real. Uh, how you handled a situation, how you did an ethical thing, Maybe that crossroads where you could go one way, you could go the other way. Um, any interesting stories that you've come across in your years? Like that where kids were telling their story? They maybe revealed something they shouldn't have? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Uh, as I interview some younger children and, and the stories When mommy told, and daddy were. <laughs> <laughs> there were some quite funny things yeah. that happen when you're dealing with the little ones. I think people get more, more guarded when they get, hopefully, when they get Cammy's yeah. age. Hopefully, exactly. But there are some... Uh, uh, yeah, many things that are said that probably shouldn't be said. Yeah. And they'll, they'll often say, by the way, a good interview can be disarming. Yeah. yeah. You almost have to be a little bit on guard, I even think, on a college interview, uh, because if they're looking for elements of negativity, yeah. uh, they can elicit it if they're, if they're good at it. Yeah, exactly. We had, we had uh, one of the top students at our school several years ago, 10 years or so ago, who wrote her essay on a questionable e escapade in her life, and uh, she did not get in to Middlebury it was. And, we tried to warn her against it. It wasn't an interview, but it was, you know, mm -hmm. on paper, which is even worse, and it just backfired on her. Okay, so uh, other piece of advice, something you can do here to cover all the bases is you can practice. Uh, practice with an adult, with a mentor. I talked about working with my mom. Uh, ask the questions. You can switch roles. You know, you could interview your dad. He can interview you uh, just to get ready. And, and, and uh, heaven forbid, if you don't get into Dartmouth and you have to apply to some of these other schools, you'll probably, you know, do it again for sure into grad school, in real life, jobs, you know, you're going to interview more than once, so you get better every time. So lots of practice, uh, practice looking in the eyes, practice the, you know, the, the non-slouching, 
uh, all of this comportment, practice shaking the hands, those things that, so it gets uh, better as you do it. Okay, a couple real quick random tips here. Be early, be on Vince Lombardi time. <laughs> Um, wear a smile, try to get those muscles working. You always, you get a natural, both of you guys have natural smiles. Uh, I don't, I t tend to be a little serious here. Uh, come alone, don't take your dad or your mom. They don't want to interview them. He, he did all this. Uh, be very positive, be very upbeat. Uh, be the person that you are, be yourself. Don't be a phony, don't try to you know, use $64 words if you don't really own those. Uh, and then be honest. Uh, and I t mentioned before, a pause can be beneficial. You can have this pregnant pause and it's okay. It shows you're thinking something's going on uh, up there. Uh, and stay away from bad mouthing. Uh, well, Dartmouth would be, I guess, any of the Ivies, you know, Yale or Cornell, and you know, you just don't want to do that. A um, couple other things to think about. Um, I think it's important for you to control the conversation. And I'm sure your dad would say, well, he needs to control it because that's the job and he needs to accomplish things. But I liked it when the kids could, uh, took the bull by the horn and showed their confidence that they were in charge, that they could read me. Um, I, I just like that. Um, always ask for clarification if you're not sure. Uh, don't bluff, don't say things that can be checked and work against you. That's the quickest way to get out of there. Um, and then know your own strengths and own weaknesses, and it's okay to touch on those. Obviously dwell on you know, the strengths more than the weaknesses. Um, and then assert yourself, sort of be aggressive and, and be the person that you are and that you want to be. And a key thing is know when to put this thing out of its misery, know when to end it, uh, so you're not just dragging it on and, and uh, making it happen longer than it should. Uh, last thing is use your interviewer's name. People love to hear their names and know if it's going to be Mr. or Bob or whomever, but say people's names. You look them in the eye and, and shake their hand. People like to hear that. Uh, terminating it, how do we know when it's done? Uh, how did you know when your interview was done? She uh, had to go take a bird out of the oven. I think she was having chicken. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Saw the smoke coming out. <laughs> yeah. And do you time yours? You've got to do a lot. I do. I, yeah. I'm almost. Yeah, you got to move. You got to I'm move. rapid uh, fire. Yeah. Uh, but if you don't, um, read the person's body language. You know, if they're fidgeting, if they're looking at their clock, they're getting up, you know, they're going to give you some signals. You know, just sort of like in a classroom when a teacher is at the end of the line and the and the you know, bell doesn't ring yet. You know, looking at the clock to watch those sorts of things. Uh, the conversation is dying. Just put it out of its misery. Um, and, and get this thing done. Then when you're done, you're not done. Uh, after the interview, really important things. An obvious thank you, uh, even send a thank you note. Uh, you can send an email, a phone call, uh, just something to follow up and get closure. Uh, and then if you've said, well, I'll get back to you on that, you know, I'll send you something or I'll clarify this or I'll give you my answer later, uh, that's probably not a bad idea. Send those promise materials that that you uh, said you were going to take, take care of here. Uh, one last thing, uh, if you want to take a look at books, there are tons of them all over the place. I just cut a few here, acing the interview, 201 best questions, best answers, and then 301 smart answers. So you can go, out this, go about this in a very academic uh, way and be analytical and systematic, uh, or you can just go with your gut. Um, if you're going to do this again, mm -hmm. uh, what would you do differently? Ooh, I do differently. Um, I would probably come in with more questions, I think. Okay. I didn't have enough questions, but we had a conversation going, so. And it was going for a while? Yeah, and then it went pretty well. Okay. What would be an example of a question you would do? Uh, hmm. Well, a question that would be, that would keep them on their toes and yeah. have them talk about something. Think about it beforehand. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Go well armed. Mm -hmm. How about any parting advice, uh, Rick, from you for interviewing? Uh, be enthusiastic. Uh, that's that's a big issue with me. I, I can you, you can usually see somebody who's got a lot of energy, uh, who is just plain positive person in general. It doesn't. It's not necessarily phony. Just mm -hmm. enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. Good. And how much does it count again for you, for these kids? A lot. A lot. Probably more so than the college. More so. I mean, and yeah. they're interviewing me as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I'm trying to make them feel more comfortable about yeah. going away from home. Yeah. But there are children. You can spot behavioral issues, which is what I'm looking for specifically yeah. is about character. They're going to be a good citizen community. Yeah. Good, because you're working with a big yeah. group of kids. Yeah, a lot of dynamics there. Okay, well let's move to uh, a little shorter uh, presentation, another PowerPoint with a conversation uh, about uh, getting good recommendations. Now, uh, most of the public school kids that, that we're going to be talking to, you know, all the schools that, that are included in this broadcast are probably not going to have uh, an interview. In fact, most of the, you know, at private schools, most of the kids don't have an interview. I would say maybe 30 out of your class, you know, are going to have uh, an interview. Uh, but everybody is probably going to have to have uh, a recommendation. You've had two recommendations, right? Mm -hmm. Two teacher recommendations yeah. and what else? I had a, I had a peer recommendation. Okay. Um, uh, 
a coach recommendation. Oh, that's right. Uh, Dartmouth and Williams asked for a peer recommendation. Yep. That's where mm -hmm. I stole that idea. Yeah. That's right. Um, and a recommendation. Yeah, and then mine. So you, you have four at least. Mm -hmm. We had a, a, a kid at Dartmouth years ago who was trying to come off the wait list, and he got 27 letters. And boy, Dartmouth got after me. They were upset with me. They thought I put them up to it. And um, the kid eventually got in. And then the following year, all these kids were turning all these letters into Dartmouth. And they really called me up and were upset with me. They don't want tons and tons of letters. They want a, a couple. And we're going to tell you the stuff you need to know about getting these uh, letters. OK, as an overview, uh, letters of recommendation. Um, and we're going to talk about the role that this thing uh, fits. Uh, the teacher recommendation, which is way different from the counselor recommendation, and then the role of the student, Cammie's job, and then my job as a writer, uh, and then the procedures, things you have to go through here. And um, when I'm doing this with live people, I provide some samples, but we can't do that now. Okay, how important are recommendations? Again, it's sort of down the food chain, but it is one piece of the puzzle that fits in. Uh, it supplements your application. It, it confirms and reaffirms everything that we think we know about Cami, but uh, it just gives a little more light. Uh, some people have talked about how my letter shines a background light on the student in the context of the school, whereas a teacher's letter shines a spotlight on Cammie in her math class, whereas my letter will talk about Cammie at home, with her family, with her sports teams, you know, just on campus, all of that. Okay, and we need both of them. Um, if, we, if we're honest about this, I don't think too many people have gotten in because of one letter, and for sure nobody's been kept out because of one letter. But again, if everything is equal, and you've got better letters of recommendation than Cammie, you get in, and she does not. You know, it sounds awful to say that, but uh, especially these schools that are looking for so much information, the darkness of the world, you know, they really need to, to call out that information. Um, again, uh, letters, uh, they know that a private school is going to be able to do a little bit better job because, you know, I've got. 50 kids to write for, and a public school teacher will have hundreds of people to write for. And some, some of our counselors have eight people to get to know and write for. So you have this decided advantage. And so what that means is it raises the bar for private school kids. They better have good recommendations. And it sort of lowers the bar for public school kids. They don't expect you to have these wonderful, glowing, specific letters. And they won't hold it against you if you don't have a great one. OK, two, two different letters, the teacher letter and uh, the counselor letter. Um, in terms of what all it takes, just so you're, you know, everybody's aware of this, to write a really good letter, it takes two to three hours. That's after you've done all the research. So you need to go and thank those two people that wrote for you tomorrow. Um, a lot of research, and the research means that we ask, uh, we ask our juniors to come up with seven or eight or nine documents, and we won't write unless they have all that stuff. And I wasn't going to write for you until your document was filled, including the parent thing. Yep. And uh, these are the poster children for, for giving good research and making me into a good writer. You know, especially the parent thing. You guys did a super job telling stories about uh, Cammy. So, um, and 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 the, the same thing. Like the, the teacher has his own research in the class, and they can you know look back at the grade narratives and things. But uh, a lot of work goes into these things, and uh, we provide the letter. Uh, we provide um, you know. In, in fact, I'm going to you know talk about what's, when, what's in each of these letters, and then what we send off, just so we can be very clear about that. Okay, what a teacher puts in is. They'll, they'll talk about the context of their class. Like, what is in, what's all involved with your lab science class? What's in the, the context of your, uh, of your um, uh, calculus AB class? Uh, they'll focus on academic skills, things that are per pertinent to uh, just their specific class. Maybe how you've been a leader, how you've stood out, how you've impacted that class and made the class better. Um, you know, your relative maturity, you know, the integrity you have, your motivation. Are you doing it just to go through uh, the motion, or do you really care about your classes. Who wrote for you again? Um, my my English teacher, Mr. Hankison, mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. Alley. Okay. Uh, do you have any idea what they wrote about? Did they share it with you at all? No, they didn't. Yeah. I have no idea. Well, at the end of the year, we can take a look at those, and okay. I'll show you my letter, and you can see them. And uh, it might be useful to have those later for you know scholarships in college and so forth. Uh, but I'm sure they you know told good good stories about you. Uh, the other thing that uh, the teacher letters will talk about is your capacity for growth. What have we seen in the three or four years? Uh, what can we project for Cami at Dartmouth compared to what what she's done here uh, with us? Uh, and then your intellectual promise. You know, is she going to be able to do the work? You know, that's the bottom line. Is she going to succeed? Is she going to be a leader? Is she going to be somebody I want in my classroom? So lots of things in the teacher letter. Um, things that are hard to to uh, measure. You know, your integrity, your independence, initiative, uh, creative problem solving abilities, all sorts of things like that. Another thing compared with students, like I can name the kids we've had at Dartmouth in the last ten years, and so I can compare you very precisely with these other kids. That's what they like to see. 
You know, compared to Joe Blow, you know, she's better at this, but maybe not quite as good at, at that. Uh, and that's very helpful information, and that authenticates, um, you know, what we have to say. You know, your personal strengths, your passion for learning, uh, those things all come out of the teacher letter, you know, the impact you have on the classroom. Is, it, is the classroom better for you having been there? And I'm guessing it is, although I haven't had you in class. Uh, and then the big thing, your commitment to uh, learning other than just the application. Um, <clears throat> okay, moving to uh, my letter, the counselor letter. Uh, we, we have a broad context. How are you in terms of the whole school compared to everybody else? Compared to how you could use the school. This is what we have. What did you take advantage of? Uh, com especially compared to other people, compared to what you might have done. Uh, what is your relationship to the faculty, the other students, and so forth? Um, Maybe we'll talk about classes. I certainly cut and paste all of the teacher comments, so I get a really good feel for who you are, and I sort of condense that and put that into one thing. Because it's like poetry. You've got to condense all these images into you know, a few lines. You can't just go on, oh, well, I could write five or six pages on you. I've got to try to get it into you know, two or three pages. You know, sometimes we'll explain the transcript. We'll explain, obviously, what does it mean that you're a three or four year starter as a varsity captain of a couple of sports. That's a huge deal. You know, we've got to put that context. Uh, we talk about sports, music, whatever your strength is, and then at places like Dartmouth, they expect you to be you know, strong in a variety of areas. Um, we also provide some perspective on the school. You know, we send a school profile, and we talk about your behavior and character. Uh, lots of things go into these, your leadership. They, you, that's an imperative if you're going places like uh, these select schools and the, the military academies. Uh, service and volunteer work, if, if it's pertinent. Uh, the effect on the school, obviously, your involvement in the community, both back east where you are and here, this local community. Um, lots of background mitigating factors, your family things, like uh, everybody doesn't have an Aussie and Harriet family, you know, or leave it to Beaver, and they've, they've got maybe tougher things to deal with than you've had, so although you've had some things that, you know, little hurdles too. So we try to put you in the context of where you're from. You know, what's the pool in which you're swimming? You know, are you swimming with sharks? You know, are you swimming by yourself? You know, do you have a harder time than other people? We try to tell, tell that story. Uh, and then the big thing at the end, I always talk about, is this person a good match for this college? You know, are we wasting our time? Or is she a match for a variety of colleges? And I can say with, with absolute clarity that you're a perfect match for Dartmouth. It's almost like they drew up Dartmouth you know, for you. Okay, what we send out then, all those big packages, we send you, ask you to bring in these envelopes. Uh, the counselor's gonna put four things. The, our letter of support, you know, this three hour little term paper we have. Uh, we'll send the school profile that tells everything about the school. Uh, again, that gives the context, you know, how many honors in AP classes, how many sports, you know, AP exams, all of those sorts of uh, things. And then we fill out those little check forms and uh, we give all the data and statistics, the secondary school report form. Uh, and then your transcript, and the transcript is really the most important document, and you've got a spectacular transcript. You know, I wouldn't embarrass you by, by sharing it, but it certainly made my transcript look sort of second rate. I bet yours too. Uh, <laughs> it, but uh, she, she did it about, you know, what every parent wants uh, the kids to do, and it certainly makes things much easier, you know, when it's that way, and the transcript speaks for itself. We also put in, and public schools don't do this, and, and even not many private schools do it, but we put in an explanation of the honor code violations. And this speaks to what you were asking about and you're talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, when you know or find out that a kid has what you would consider an honor code violation, how does that affect his entrance to your program? A very big way. Big way. It, it's uh, where children live, in our case, it's a resident camp. So yeah. they're living 3,000, 5,000 miles away from home. Yeah. They better be able to get along with other people. Yeah, and, and that's our, our situation. We've yeah. got half of our population is there in, in our own community. And every year we have some honor code violations, don't we? we? I mean, nobody's immune from it, and you're privy to those. They're your friends. You may have been on a JC. Mm -hmm. And how does that work? Um, well, you have four students who are in front of the, uh, the um, person who violated the honor code. And um, they just decide, they give a recommendation to um, Mr. Wonky, who makes the final decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how do you feel about the fact that we uphold our ethical end of the bargain with colleges, and we tell that story? Actually, we, we have the students tell the story. Like, I won't send materials. None of the college counselors will send materials unless or until this person tells his story. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's drinking or being after hours or cheating on a test, any honor code violation. Uh, and what happens. Uh, how, as a student, how do you feel about that? Um, well, better not get in trouble. Okay. <laughs> as, as a parent, do you think that's a fair thing to do? I, absolutely. I think that, in fact, Stevenson has a very clear honor code. In effect, I wish more schools 
would have as much clarity. I'm not sure how the colleges translate that. But we, I know as a parent, I can speak more as a parent, that it's, uh, yeah. I think it's phenomenal that, that people are held accountable and there's clarity within the community of what the code is. Because yeah. I think it gets very murky it in many does. communities. It does, and, and if it's very murky on the college level. Uh, and there, there are basically two ways they look at these letters. If, if these honor code violations are about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, they don't care because they've got their hands full on a college campus. <laughs> Drinking is terrible. They're, they're closing fraternities like crazy. Yeah. It's a rite of passage. They, they can't handle it. They can't deal with it themselves. But the other end, uh, honor code violations of plagiarism, uh, stealing, you know, self-plagiarism, taking somebody else's tests or essays, you know, writing crib sheets, those sorts of things, uh, or violence, you know, f fighting, or, or uh, not just using drugs, but if you, if you create, you know, if you're growing drugs, if you're selling them, those sorts of things, they take those things seriously, because those have to do with citizenship and the community they're gonna create. So we, we send those things, and not everybody does, and maybe it puts us at a disadvantage, but I think in the long run, it gives us an advantage because when I say good things about a student, they pay attention. They know when they're getting you, they're getting the real McCoy. Um, and so, you know, we just do that because it's the right thing to do and because we've agreed to, and in the long run, it, it, it helps us. Okay, getting back to uh, what we send here. This is an example of our profile. We've just redone it, but it's the story of telling about the school, all the nitty gritty, uh, the soup to nuts, what we do, what we don't do, what our policies are. It's a four page document. We also then send the transcript, and this is not a real good picture of one, but you can sort of see here. Uh, it's your four-year record of the classes you've taken, how you challenge yourself, uh, what any patterns are. It's one of the little twists we put on uh, this thing. The, it's, it's, the no, what is, it's the spin zone as opposed to O'Reilly's no spin zone. Uh, we'll talk about the glitches and the little mistakes and why you got the D and what you did to make up for it. We'll try to make you look good while keeping within the realm of honesty about this thing so that they really understand what our school's like, what you went through, and what it means that you went out of the way and you did a makeup course with B BYU where somebody else didn't do it because they didn't feel they needed it, but you did it because it was the right thing. So we send those things. A um, little bit more uh, quick advice here as we wrap this up. Uh, everybody make copies of the application uh, so you know what exactly is going on. Read the directions, uh, read it very closely, make sure you answer what they want. Know how many recommendations and normally what do they ask for? How many recommendations? How well did you learn here? Um, I, well, I thought they had two teacher recommendations. Yeah, two. And they've got to be in two ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Math, science, history, English, language. You know, they want to see how your brain works. And then beyond that, what would be some, some categories where somebody else could write? Um, like a coach, someone who knows you really well. Um, yeah, so they want to get the whole big picture here. So usually two application or recommendations, maybe four or five would be okay, seven, eight, a little excessive. Uh, and you have to decide who you're going to uh, get them from, um, who's going to be reading, how many, uh, what they're going to put into them. In fact, we have a little workshop where we, we, we tell you certain ways you can help and create your own um, recommendation. You tell some teachers, this is, remember this, remember edit this, this is my paper, this is what you said about me last year. So help craft it yourself. Uh, I do that. You know, that's why I'm able to write you know, and, and agonize for three hours and write these two and three page recommendations because I get these great things from parents and other teachers and other sources. And then we send this out directly with the uh, application. Sometimes they want it to be included in your, your part of the application and we sort of fight that but uh, know exactly what, what they want. Uh, and then the real key piece of information which a lot of people don't recognize is that you need to sign that confidential waiver. And that says that you promise not to look at what I wrote about you. Even though we say, geez, we say good things and we support you and I will even give it to you at the end of the year. But for their purposes, they want to be able to believe what the teacher says. And if you have access to it, they're just not going to trust what the teacher says. They're going to say, well, didn't really tell us the truth because we knew that you had access to it. So make sure you sign that. Okay, deciding who you, t who you ask. You can maybe brainstorm a list, ask your counselor, maybe your parents. Uh, but definitely a junior, senior year teacher, somebody who knows you well. Uh, somebody who likes you, although they don't have to like you a great deal, but they have to be a good teacher and a good writer. Uh, it's best to have somebody with authority. Like, I would want me to write for me. I would want Miss Grogan to write for me. I would want Jeff Young, the dr athletic director, to write. Uh, if you work for a, a company or a group, I'd want to get close to the boss. People with authority you know, to jazz up uh, your application. Um, and again, you don't have to have straight A's. You just have to have a good, solid class, good, solid teacher. And remember, um, academic classes and you know, two academic writers is plenty. Uh, some people that um, very specific that you can uh, answer here or, or, or look at, for examples, a coach. Obviously, you mentioned that. A minister. I had uh, my minister, I remember when I was a kid, 
uh, if that's an important part of your life, uh, your advisor, uh, your employer, a family friend, all that can be a little dicey. And it's really important an alumnus if the alumnus knows you and can uh, really talk about you. Who you don't want to have, uh, senators, bigwigs, name, name droppers. Uh, it doesn't matter to you that they know somebody or they, they know somebody that looks like you or whatever. Uh, in most cases, unless you've worked for that person and they know about you, don't do it. A favorite story I have, I had a, a student in my English class. I also wrote for her. I was her advisor. She came up to me and said, do you think it would be okay if I had Mother Teresa write for me? <laughs> and I said, well, of course. Why don't you get Elvis while you're at it? And no, she said, I'm seriously. I, I spent the summer with Mother Teresa. And, and lo and behold, she did. I uh, spent the first half of the summer in Paris, the second half in, in, uh, in India working with Mother Teresa. In fact, she brought in a picture with Mother Teresa's arm around her. And so she did, and it was wonderful. She didn't get in everywhere, but, but, but lo and behold, she was telling the truth. I, I thought it was pretty clever. Um, so be careful about who you, uh, who you write or who you have write for you. Okay, uh, a lot of specific details I'm going to sort of jump through here. Um, um, you don't, don't just drop your stuff off. You know, offer to meet with them, give them a little resume, help them do their job. Um, and you know, help the coach you know, talk about character, you know, your parent, English teacher talks about your communication things, uh, those sorts of deals. Uh, the worst thing you can do is just drop it off without meeting face to face. I hate that when kids do that. Uh, provide all the letters, all the things you need to do. Um, and do it all at once. Don't do it sort of you know, willy nilly here. Uh, make sure it's all very, very complete. Okay, we're gonna, uh, the last thing here, you're going to follow up to make sure it happens by giving some reminders. You know, thank them, do it. In fact, two weeks before they're due, it's a good idea to thank them, and this will remind them, boy, if I haven't done it, I better get going and, and do it. Um, okay, um, that, that sort of brings that to a close. And I want to give, give a chance for, I'm going to put you on a little hot seat here. I want to give, uh, give you a chance to give the last thoughts on your best piece of advice on recommendations. You're going to tell other high school kids what you can do, and you're going to tell from your perspective as the person who reads them, what do you want to see in a recommendation? All right? You're on the hot seat. Okay. And this is the whole college process? No, this is just about just, recommendations. Okay. Finish that off. Um, for recommendations, um, make sure that you have all your materials. Um, don't forget, don't leave spaces for your counselor to fill them out. Yeah. Um, but also really guide your counselor mm -hmm. um, and help structure yeah. um, the actual Your team. content, yeah. Okay. What do you like to see? I don't want to see mediocrity. Yeah. I want to see somebody who's going to say something, this person's special. Yeah. They really deserve to book. You want to jump off the page. I want to jump off the page. In yeah. fact, I'd be careful as to who you get your recommendations from. Yeah. If it's an enthusiastic person who absolutely is prone not to give a, anything but a very strong recommendation, find somebody else if it's, yeah. if it's not okay. the case. Okay. One past la uh, uh, parting thought here. Single best piece of advice about this whole process? Whole college process? Yeah, the whole thing. Uh, give yourself time, but um, remain calm. Okay, good. Start early. I hear that all the time, all the time. Uh, two good pieces of advice. Okay, we're right at the end of the line. This, this hour and this week goes pretty fast, and I want to uh, thank um, Rick and his lovely daughter, Cami. I wish we could say everybody at Stevens was like Cami, but she's a star. <laughs> Uh, and stars come from uh, wonderful parents. So we want to thank them. I want to thank uh, uh, the students and parents watching today. And I want to invite you to uh, be with us at the beginning of January, uh, January 6th, I, I think it is. We're going to talk about standardized testing. And I want to close with my, uh, with my mantra here. Uh, remember, it's never too early to start thinking about uh, college, and it's never too late uh, to get started on it. Uh, this is Dave Miller uh, with College Prep for You, wishing you find the right match for you. Good luck.